Okay, I, th I think we are live. Welcome everybody. Today we are together with Ben. Uh, th thanks a lot, Ben, for joining us today. It's really our pleasure to have you with us today. He's going to talk about Power Query, how Power Query thinks, what is happening under the hood uh, while using Power Query. I'll, may, I'll cut the introduction short. Thanks a lot, Ben, for joining us. We are listening to you. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me and good evening, everybody. I'm Ben Grabato, a architect, developer, data guy, maybe you could say a solutions engineer, blog regularly at bengrabato.com. You can follow me on Twitter if you have an interest at bgrabato. But enough about me. We're here to talk about Power Query and specifically how Power Query thinks. How does Power Query's mashup engine process the expressions you write? Query folding is one key concept where behind the scenes, the engine may transform part or all of your M code into the data source's native query language. Then ask the source to execute that query. Streaming, though perhaps a less familiar of a term, is even more fundamental as it describes how table, list, and binary data flows between functions in M. Perhaps you've heard of these terms. Today we're going to explore what they mean and hopefully give you some applications that you, know, you can pull out of what we've discussed for now or for in the future as you develop in Power Query. So let's take the mystery out of these two terms. But before we get to them, we'll lay a foundation of basic concepts about how the Power Query language works. Altogether, the goal of our time together is to give you an understanding of how Power Query thinks so you can write more efficient mashups, are better positioned to debug problems, and can avoid unexpected variability in results. Let's get going. Foundational concept number one, M, is partially lazy. Here we have a let expression. When this expression is executed, which variables are evaluated? Well, only variable A, because we only need the result from variable A's expression to satisfy what this Power Query let expression is asking for. Since B is not needed, the expression defining B is never invoked, so call service B is never executed. M is lazy in this sense, but partially lazy. The same rules hold true for records. That was a let expression. Here's a record. Here we're accessing the record we're calling data. We're accessing its field A. Since there's no need for field B's data, the expression defining field B is not invoked just like our let expression we saw a minute ago. Fact though, we could get rid of the let expression by rewriting a little bit. Again, the same rules apply. We've defined a record, but we're only accessing part of the data in it, the data we're not touching. M, why should I waste my effort computing that data? Good for you, good for me. It's doing what's necessary and not what's unnecessary. Now, as a side note, this record expression here looks very similar to the let expression we started with. Not only are these two expressions similar, but practically speaking, they're behind the scenes the same because let is syntactical sugar for a record, a record expression. So if you understand the rules of how a record works, you understand how a let expression works. If you understand how a let expression works, you can take what you know about that and apply it to records. A little shortcut there to help us out. All right, so M is partially lazy. It's partially lazy, that implies it's not always lazy. A principal exception to its laziness are function arguments. M evaluates function arguments eagerly. In this let expression. We know, of course, let expressions are lazy, so to figure out what pieces of data are needed, we probably should start down in the result clause that 
bit of code after the in, and we see we got a function invocation. So let's work backwards and figure out what happens here. So we have a function invocation, so we're going to invoke function do something. Do something has two arguments which are being passed into it, the values of variables a and b. And you notice I said that those values are being passed in because they're going to be eagerly evaluated. Now, if you look at the function itself, we see that we're only ever using one of the two values passed in. But that doesn't matter to M because here M is not lazy, it's eagerly, eagerly evaluating. So here, M is going to call service A and call service B because the values of both variables A and B are needed by this function. I should say the values of both A and B are needed to satisfy, to, to make this function call happen. Now, you and I know that we really don't need both A and B. So is there a way we could change things so that M behaves more or less lazily with a function call? Sure, let's just refactor our code a little bit. Notice what we did. We changed variables A and B so that they're not holding the result of calling function as uh, call service A and call service B, but just references to those functions. I'm sorry, to yeah, to those functions. And then inside the function, do something. The then we're not returning the value of A, we're returning the value produced by invoking A. And the else is not returning the value of B anymore, it's returning the value produced by invoking B. So here, when the in clause is evaluated, do something is going to be invoked. And to do that, we still need the values of both A and B. And M is going to uh, you know, fill them in eagerly. But now those values and what it needs to figure out is just how to set those values to references to the two functions, not to actually invoke the functions. So we're doing very little work and we're saving the work of deciding which call service function to invoke to our if then else clause and we only invoke the service that really needs to be called. M is partially lazy, not always. Function arguments are a principal exception. One more foundational concept about the M language to cover is that M is immutable. The code on the right here is not Power Query. Just some pseudo code I made up, but let's take a look at what's going on here. For here we have examples of the opposite of immutable. We have examples of mutability. We have a variable x, we set it to a value, then we add three to it, then we look at its value and we change x to either five or two, depending on how our if then else clause evaluates. Here we have manipulated or mutated the value of x. You can't do this in M because with records and list, I'm sorry, and let expressions, once you assign a value to a variable, that's the variable's value. So in this let expression, the result clause is returning a list. The list has two elements. Both of them reference the value of variable A. So how many times is call service A invoked? Exactly once. The first time that function is invoked, its value is saved into the variable. And then any subsequent times that the value of that variable is needed, the saved value is returned. So here, even though the list returned has two items in it, both of which need the value from A to be computed, A is only invoked one time. This behavior also holds true if A's expression returns an error. If calling service A raised an error, that error is going to be saved into the variable. And then each time that variable is accessed, the error, error will be re-raised. So M is immutable. Now what if for some strange reason we don't like this and we want service A to be called once per list item? Can we make that happen? Absolutely. Let's just get rid of the variable. Here we're defining a list. It's got two function calls, two service A in it. 
since the value from calling that function is not being saved to a variable or record field anywhere, the immutability rule doesn't play in. If when this list is evaluated, call service A will be invoked once for the first list item and once for the second. Now you notice that there's an asterisk by the word immutable here. M is immutable and everything I have told you is true, but there's more going on than meets the eye. To illustrate, to understand, let's look at this query. It is returning a table, which is often what we want to do with Power Query. Let's start at the result clause and walk backwards to see what's going on. So the result clause returns the value of first three. First three calls table first in, and it passes in the value of filtered, and we know that function arguments are eagerly evaluated. So let's go figure out what the value of filtered is. Filtered, let's see, that's a call to function table select rows. We're passing in as its first argument source. Again, arguments are eagerly evaluated. So what's the value of source? Well, it's the result of calling the function get data. Now, based on what we've covered so far, it looks like that to evaluate this expression, this query, get data is invoked and all the data returned by it is saved into variable source. And then table select rows is invoked and the data in source is passed into that function call and all the data returned by the select rows call is saved into variable filtered, which in turn is passed into the call to table first in, and all those results are saved into variable first three and then returned. But that's not what happens. And I'm glad it's not what happens. Let's take a look at some of the disadvantages if it worked this way. Across the top of the screen here, you can see our three steps, source filtered in first three. And we'll call the approach I just described the simplistic approach, where all the rows from source have to be, I should say all the rows from get data have to be saved into source. Then they're handed into filtered, and the rows produced by filtered are saved into that variable. And then those rows are handed into uh, the first in function, and the results are saved into that variable, and then they're handed off to you know, the user interface, whatever it is that requests it this expression to be evaluated. While this works and it produces the data that you would expect, can you see a couple downsides? One of them is that we have to have local resources to save all the data that source might contain. Now we know that we're returning in the end at most three rows. But what if source contains 30 trillion rows? Well, I'd have to have local resources. My computer has to have the capacity of holding 30 billion rows locally. If it doesn't have that ability, I can't process this query, at least not with the simplistic approach. So with the simplistic approach, my local resources limit my ability to process data. But you also notice we're ultimately returning three rows. Now, let's think about this for a minute. Do I need to pull all 30 billion rows from source to get those three rows? Well, I don't know, but it's quite possible that maybe I only need the first 50 rows or first 100 rows from source or something. You know, I might not need every single row from source to come up with the three, three qualifying rows to return. But there's no shortcut here to stop all the rows from being fetched from source. So here with the simplistic approach, I always have to process all rows, even if I don't need all those rows. Thankfully, this is not how Power Query works. Power Query, when it processes list, table, and binary data, can use something called streaming. Let's take a look. Now, if we remember our query, we had three variables, right? Source, filtered, and first. We know that function arguments are eagerly evaluated. 
But I'm telling you that M, when it evaluates those function arguments, you know, calculates those variables values, is not saving all the data that those function calls would return into those variables. So what is it saving into those variables? Not the data, but rather a handle that could be used to get the requested data on demand. If you are a .NET developer, you could think of the concept of I enumerable, you know, link, I queryable. Well, not I queryable, we'll get, that would be query folding, but I enumerable. So the variable first three is not populated with three rows, but rather a handle that when invoked will return up to three rows. The variable filtered is not populated with all the rows that would be produced by that function called a table select rows, but rather a handle that when invoked can be iterated to produce the rows, filtered set of rows. And the same thing with source, it's not populated for all the 30 trillion rows from source, but rather a handle that when invoked can pull rows from source. Those handles are immutable. So variables stay immutable, just like we've been talking about in M. But for table, list, and binary data, which are when these handles are used, since the data itself is not saved in the variable, the data itself is not immutable. And we'll explain more about that in a minute. Let's try to put an example here, look at it, uh, how this would work in a scenario to make more sense out of it. So source filtered in first three are all handles. When the host application, say the user interface, query editor, whatever, once rows, it asks the handle in variable first three, says row please. That handle, it, you know, turns around or the, the function call powering that handle turns around and asks the handle return by variable filtered for a row. And in turn, the handle for source is asked for a row. So you'll see here, there's a request that's flowed from the requester all the way back to source. Source does whatever it needs to do to get a row and it returns it to filtered. Or the select rows expression in filter looks at that row checks it oh hey it passes our filter test it returns it to the uh, first in function call that's saved into variable three or that defined i'm sorry variable first three and it's returned the consumer of these rows asks for another row a request flows back down filtered call source source returns a row and this time Filtered select row expression looks at the row and says it doesn't pass the test. But select rows still has this outstanding request for a row. So it turns around and asks source for another row. Passes it, select rows looks at it. This time it passes the test, hands it to first three, and it's returned to the host. And this process repeats until first three has returned three rows or until there are no more rows that could be returned. So this is called streaming. And with streaming, rows flow between steps one at a time on an as needed basis. So we've gained a couple advantages here. First off, we don't need local resources to hold all 30 trillion rows in memory or on disk because we're only pulling them one at a time. And secondly, as soon as we have enough rows to satisfy what our query is asking for, execution stops. If we get the three rows we're looking for by only pulling 50 rows from source, we only need to pull 50 rows from source. Again, key concept with streaming, rows flow between steps one at a time. Now, a little additional context, a step may internally hold more than one row at a time. And you'll see this commonly with a data source. A data source, say when you query a web API, you, know, you might get 100 rows back. 
per page, right? If you're getting a, a set of data from that source. So what would happen then is internally that source is going to hold the 100 rows in a buffer and stream them out one at a time. The data connector, I should say, will hold that 100 rows in a buffer, stream them out one at a time as requested. And then when the buffer is empty, turn around and pull the next page from the source. Still much better than holding 30 trillion rows in a buffer. So a little buffering can go on internally, but rows flow between steps one at a time. Now, that idea of buffering flowing uh, going on internally is something we ought to give a little more attention to. Because in the example we looked at, the only place that might be going on would be the source. But here in this uh, query, there's another place where buffering could be going on. Here we've got three steps. I've left off the M expressions. They're not really relevant, but we're seeing here that we're taking a filtered set of data. And to produce that, we're sorting it and we're pulling from source. So the, you know, sort the data from source is being sorted, filtered, and then returned. Now, how do you sort data? Can you sort data by only looking at one row at a time? Well, no. To sort data, you have to have the whole set of data and then sort it. So sort, unless somehow it knows that it's getting data that's pre-sorted, but setting that aside, otherwise sort is going to have to buffer everything from source before it can satisfy filters requests for a row. So let's walk backwards here. The user interface or, or you know, your tool wants a row, so it asks filtered for a row. Filtered turns around and asks sort for a row. Sort can't just pull one row from source and then return it. Sort turns around and pulls one row at a time until it has all rows from source. Then it sorts them and then it returns the first row to filtered and filtered returns it out to the host application. And then when the host application wants another row, it asks filtered, filtered asks sort, and sort can pull that row right out of its buffer. It doesn't have to go back to source. It's already got the rows. It pulls the second row and returns it. Now, this is still an improvement over the simplistic approach we saw before, because with that approach, every step saved all its rows into a variable. Here, the buffering's only going on where needed. But, it still poses a problem in our case because source has 30 billion rows, which means sort needs to hold 30 billion rows. And if our system can't do that, or 30 trillion, I forget how many I said, if our system doesn't have the resources to do that, it's bad. And maybe we don't really need all those rows because of the filtered clause. So is there a way we could improve things? Absolutely, because with streaming, order matters. Look at these steps here on the right. Same steps as we had on the left, but I've just reversed the order of step two and three. Now, the data that is sorted has been pre-filtered. So let's look at it, how it would execute. When the host application runs, it asks step three, the sort step for a row, sort turns around and asks filtered for all of its rows. Filtered pulls those from source. But step three, the sort step, is only buffering in memory the filtered rows. Again, may maybe it's just a thousand rows that pass the filter. So the buffer for step three, the right, the sort on the right, is much, much smaller than the buffer necessary on the left. In any other case, the same result is achieved. Just one is much more efficient than the other. So a streaming order matters. Try to put you know, put your data source first, of course, but then try to put steps that would exclude rows before you put steps that would buffer rows in your queries. Here we put the filtered before the sort. Now, you might ask, well, how do I know which steps buffer? I wish I could point you to documentation that would clearly lay that out, but unfortunately, I'm not aware of any official documentation containing that information. So what I could encourage you to do is to 
to think about your function calls, you know, the ones you're making, and think, in order for this to work, do I need to buffer? Does it need to buffer rows? A sort? Yeah, quite quite possibly. A group by? Well, to group by, you got to sort, right? Okay, some, some joins may buffer, uh, but a filter, well, like table select rows, that doesn't need to buffer. It can process one row at a time, so no reason for it to buffer. So that's how, you know, you kind of have to make an intelligent, informed guess as to which rows internally might buffer and which not as you think about order. Order matters when streaming. So here's a got you to be aware of with streaming, and that's restreaming or multiple iteration. Here we have a let expression. It's returning a list. The list contains two items. The first item and the second item, well, they're both the sum of values in the amount column. So how many times will the values in source amount be streamed? Well, it, unless M's doing something special internally, we could expect it to stream those values twice. The first list sum needs those values and it's going, it streams them one at a time, right? And then to produce the second list item, why it's called a list sum as well. And it's going to stream those values one at a time. Now, is this a problem? Well, it could waste resources and it could produce unexpected results. Why? Remember that with streaming, the data can be getting re-pulled from source. What if sources data changes in between the two streamings? You know, may, maybe someone adds another row into the table. Maybe someone edits a value in, a in, the, in the source data. It is possible that this expression could produce two different values for the sums. Even though looking at this expression, you might think they should be exactly the same, but because multiple iterations or multiple restreaming could have occurred, you could end up with different values. Now you say, but wait a minute, I, I wouldn't write code like this. And I agree, we probably wouldn't ask for the same value twice like this. And if we really needed it, what we could do is uh, call list sum once, save its value into a variable, and then just reference that variable twice here. But what you might find do yourself doing is writing code that does something like this behind the scenes or, or leads to something like this occurring. Let's say you wanted the sum and the average. So you wrote list sum, and then that second call was list average. Well, behind the scenes, how do you compute an average? Well, you need a sum as part of it, right? Okay, you might in effect cause something like this to happen and could expose yourself to some variation or variability in the results you, you receive back because the data changed between streaming. Now, sometimes M is going to help you out by doing some special data caching behind the scenes. That's another topic for another day. We're not guaranteed that will happen. So how would we guard against or protect ourselves from this challenge? Ta -da. We could explicitly buffer data. You notice here, that our two list sum function calls no longer reference source directly, but they're referencing variable buffered. Buffered calls table buffer. So what happens here is that when data is needed from buffered, a, the data from source is saved internally or buffered, you know, perhaps in memory. And then any future references to variable buffered are satisfied out of that buffer. So we are only streaming once from source here. Now we do have to have the local resources to hold everything in, in a buffer. But when used responsibly, buffering can be very, very helpful. It can save 
unnecessary movement of data, unnecessary computations, and give stability in the results we get. So that's a gotcha to be aware of with streaming. Now, here's that expression we saw a minute ago, that Power Query. And we've talked about how, thankfully, Power Query doesn't use that simplistic approach we discussed, but instead may use streaming. In fact, it, it you could th say it always uses conceptually some form of streaming, but one of your team members looks at this and starts saying, you know, if I was on the database server, if I, if I could just write a SQL query, I could write a query like this, the assuming, of course, the source is a SQL server. Um, and we've got indexes, in-memory caches. I mean, this would run blazingly fast on the SQL server and we'd get back exactly the three rows we want. Whereas the Power Query on the left, why it, it may have to stream a bunch of rows to produce the three at once. All right, so does this mean that if performance matters, we just need to write SQL queries, you know, native queries directly ourselves? You know, maybe wrap, you know, maybe we just write a little bit of Power Query that says execute this native query and then put the SQL query in there. Well, thankfully not, thanks to something called query folding. Because with query folding, depending on the version of the mashup engine you're using, the particular data connector you're using and your data source, Power Query may be able to rewrite the expression on the left into more or less the equivalent of, of what we saw on the a moment ago on the right. So it could translate that expression on the left into the SQL we saw on the right and then just wrap it with that basic Power Query statement that's needed to execute a manually specified SQL statement. So you got, with query folding, you, you got the benefit of being able to express what you want it in beautiful Power Query. <laughs> and behind the scenes, thanks to Power Query translating it into an optimized native expression, well, you got the best of both worlds. You got the advantage of using your data source's performance tuned engine to produce just what you need it. This is what query folding does. It takes a set of steps, a set of function calls really, and folds them up into something that can then be offloaded to the data source for processing. Now, in the example we just looked at, all of the steps could be folded together into a single native request handed off to the data source. But remember I said, folding depends on the mashup engine, the data source and the data connector. So not every function call is always going to be foldable. Here we have a expression and it's got four steps in it. The first two are foldable. And the second two are not. So what happens? Well, the first two get folded together. And the, uh, the third and fourth don't. Makes sense, right? So when the host application asks the last step for a row, it's going to turn around because we have streaming going on, right? It's going to turn around and ask the previous step for a row. Step number two, looking at the right here. Step number two is going to turn around and ask step number one for a row. The expression, the code generated by query folding gets executed, a row gets returned and it's streamed out, you know, and the host application keeps streaming rows until there are no more rows to be returned or until, you know, everything, whatever the query is asked for is satisfied. Now, here's a variation, you know, we have four steps again. The first two are foldable, like we saw before. The third one is not foldable. And the fourth one is also eligible for folding. But remember, query folding folds steps back to source. In that middle step, the non-foldable step is going to block query folding from happening for any subsequent step. So steps one and two can still be folded. Step three obviously can't be folded, but step four, even though it 
could be folded. It can't be folded because there's a step in between that keeps it from being collapsed into source. Now, it turns out that Power Query may help you out here because Power Query also may choose the Mashup Engine to optimize your expression. And so if it can tell that in this case, steps three and four can safely be reversed without changing the result ultimately produced, it may, behind the scenes, reorder those steps. And so now, with this optimized version of the query, steps one, two, and three can all be folded together, leaving just step four, which is now step two, not folded. So order matters with query folding, and I'd encourage you that just like streaming, order matters, but with query folding, I'd encourage you, you know, not to rely on this, I should say with both, I'd encourage you not to rely on M to rewrite your expressions behind the scenes, but instead try to get them into optimal order. And if you miss a point there, then maybe this optimization will help you out. So try to order your foldable steps first, follow, and then, you know, the non-foldable ones after. All right, order matters, but sometimes it helps you out. Interesting side note is this optimization can go on even when query folding isn't involved, even when there's no data source involved. M can look at your expression and has the freedom to reorganize it so long as it doesn't change the results returned. This brings us to privacy levels, the data protection firewall. All right, what's going on in this expression? Well, we're pulling rows from A. We're filtering them by looking at their the ID column in A. Checking whether B's filtered ID column, if one of the values in filter IDs matches A's ID column, right? So we're saying return the row from A if its ID column is in B filter ID. So query folding, as we've discussed so far, doesn't help us here because we've got two different data sources involved. And since they're different data sources, we can't reduce all this filter into a, uh, I mean, two sources, two native queries, right? This filter touches data from both, so we can't fold all this into one query. But what if filter ID say contains four values and A contains a billion values? Hmm. But once we apply that set of four values, the four filter IDs, you know, we're going to have a very small set of data. Hmm. If we were writing SQL, we would take those four values and write them into the query sent to A. So instead of needing to stream all rows from source A, we just need to stream those rows that have been pre-filtered. And this is something that query folding can do. So it could, IMS query folding engine can decide to take data from one source and fold it into the native query it sends to another source. which is really neat, but also really dangerous. If both sources contain benign public data, probably no problem. But what if source B is, say, some highly proprietary, strategically important company data? And source A, well, it's a free public web service run by one of your competitors. Do you want to take your highly proprietary data and have it, or do you want him to take it and have it folded into something sent to your competitor? Well, probably not. The sole purpose of the data protection firewall is to control whether cross data source data folding is allowed. It's what those data privacy level settings do. Can I fold, can infold data from one source to another or not? There is one question regarding- Absolutely. Uh, uh, query folding. How, how does performance of a query which is isn't folded compared to just running a SQL statement directly on the database? Great question. So let's step back here. 
if M can fully fold your query, then, you know, so if we, if M can take what you wrote on the left and fold it into something like on the right, then, you know, performance is going to be about the same as if you executed it directly in a tool, you know, SSM Master Azure Data Studio. Because that's in essence what we're doing on the right. Here's the query. Here's just the basic M code wrapped around it that says what server to execute it on and the server's doing the hard work and just giving us the three rows we need. Now, that quite likely is going to be vastly per better performant than what we wrote on the left if streaming's involved because with streaming, we have to get rows from the data source we have to pull perhaps many rows from the data source. You know, we have to pull as many as we need to satisfy what we're looking for, you know. So we're grabbing rows from the source until we find three rows where code equals 50. Well, how many rows do we need to get from source to do that? I don't know. It could be three rows. It could be 3,000. It could be 3 million. Whereas on the right, you know, we're getting much better performance because the database server, you know, we've offloaded to the database server all the hard processing. You know, it's just basically giving us the three rows we need to return to the host application. Did that help? I think it is. You can keep going. <laughs> Wonderful. So privacy levels. Sole purpose to control whether data from one source can be folded into another. Now, question comes, when is query folding occurring? If you go into query editor, on the right, typically you'll see a list of steps. If you right click on a step, the little pop-up menu that shows up, there is a option called view native query, circled here in yellow. If that step is active, here it's not, if it's active, you know that that step is being query folded. If the, uh, the menu option is inactive, however, you don't know what's going on. <laughs> All you know is that the UI can't tell you whether query folding is taking place or not. In this case, query folding is taking place on this step, but again, you can't tell from the UI. Why can't you tell? Well, in this case, behind the scenes, the, the Mashup engine folded the three steps circled in red together. So it reversed the order of the third and fourth steps. It reversed the order of add it, custom, and sort it rows. And because it reversed the order, it could fold source navigation and sort it rows together. But the UI doesn't know how to follow that. You know, it, the query that was executed doesn't match what the UI is showing, so it's kind of hard for the UI, I guess, to show you <laughs> that query folding is happening on that step because what you're seeing in this applied steps list is not exactly what, what happened behind the scenes. So unfortunately, there is not an easy authoritative way to tell whether query folding is taking place. What you may need to do if you want to dig into whether folding is occurring is use query diagnostics or go to your source system and run some kind of trace and somehow or another through one of those means or something similar, capture the native query that was sent to the data source. And then look at that query and determine what logic's in there, you know, how it compares with your M expression. And so you should probably be able to ascertain, okay, my query that was sent to the source looks like this. So I can see that that where clause came from, you know, a table select rows expressions I wrote. The top clause came from, you know, a table first in bit that I wrote. You kind of have to reverse engineer that query back to your native, uh, to your power query, the, the native query back to your power query to uh, get a sense for what's being folded. I know it's sad. I, I really hope that one day this could be vastly improved. In fact, I'd love to see a little icon by each step there indicating whether it's folded 
partially fully or not folded at all. Because query folding, as the question uh, our listener asked just a few minutes ago, and thank you for that question, by the way, can vastly affect performance. Normally, uh, we want we want to offload as much as we can to the the data source. We want things to be folded. You know, probably your ideal order of query steps would be put all the foldable steps first so that they can be folded. And then put for the rest of the steps where streaming is going to take place, put the steps that don't do buffering, but that could filter rows out, and then follow it by the steps that would buffer. You know, so we're trying to be strategic where the work happens. Let the data source do what it's good at. Handle that fold it query. Then apply the steps that could further cut down the quantity of rows we're working with. And then, if possible, only then do whatever local buffering we need so that we're being efficient in what we're doing local. So again, keep in mind what we've been talking about query folding and streaming applies to table data and list data and at least binary data is streamed. I don't know that query folding really plays into it. I, I can't say for sure, but you know, there we have it. That's, that's what query folding is. That's what streaming is. We also talked about M being immutable and M being partially lazy. So thank you so much. And I'd be really curious what questions we might have. Okay. Uh, there is no questions yet. Uh, for, for the streaming part, I'm personally planning to read your M primer series again from scratch, Ben. <laughs> oh, I'm honored. I'm honored. <laughs> really? And, and documentation regarding uh, Power Query uh, sometimes is not good enough <laughs> to give you clue about those neat tricks and things, really. Okay, uh, what is your recommendation for a better performance? Reordering the steps to always first folding and then all others or the vice versa? That's a good question. So, I'd say with performance tuning, Stepping back for a <coughs> first, you know, we've shared some concepts, but I'd always encourage you to apply to, to be strategic where you apply problems. If you're working with a small data set and performance is fine, you know, don't sweat over tuning it because you don't have a performance problem, right? But then, yes, I, I would say to try to order steps so that you know the fold the steps that can be folded come first. And then after those steps, you know, all the rest of the steps are going to be streamed. Try to order the steps out of those streaming steps. Order the ones that would reduce rows before any that would buffer rows. So, so that way we're offloading as much work as we can to the external system, you know, the data source. And then the rows, as they get streamed, we're throwing away the rows we don't need. <laughs> before we do anything where we actually have to pay the, the resource costs to hold them, you know, in memory or on disk. So, yes, so so what you put down there, you know, put non-folding steps, you know, to the end or to, you know, to the, I guess you could, yeah, to the end, you know, definitely the general rule to apply. And again, these are general rules. The goal here is to offload work, right? So if you've got the work offloaded, you know, and that's 95% of the work, maybe the order of the last 5% doesn't matter because you've already got it enough offload. But the general rule, yes, yeah, is offload as much as you can to the remote system by putting the foldable steps first and the non-foldable after. Okay, there is another question regarding performance, I guess. Duplicate a table or bring two tables from the source. Hmm. All right, so I'd be curious on a little <laughs> more context there. So are we talking about having the same data 
Uh, I'm duplicating a it, it table. Might be. I don't know. So, if you brought two tables from a source where both have the same data in them, that actually might not perform quite as well as if you had one table <laughs> and you streamed out of it twice or query folded out of it twice. Well, first for query folding, if if you duplicate it, take the same data in two tables, well, the query folding engine doesn't know that the data is the same between the two tables. So it might not be able to come up with an as efficient native query, or maybe couldn't come up with one at all. Whereas if it knows that it's one table and you're just referencing that table twice, it may be able to come up with a native query that, you know, may touch the table twice, but it's still a single native query. Other reason why I'd be leaning away towards duplicating the table, again, assuming that two duplicates are the same data in them, is that M sometimes caches native query results. And if if it sees two tables, then it can't, you know, that's hurting your ability to use that cache because again, it doesn't know the data is the same between the two tables. So it can't reuse the cache. Whereas if, if you're touching the table once, I mean, if you're touching the same table twice, it may be able to use the data it cached the first time. Okay. Uh, maybe instead of duplicating, mm -hmm. uh, referencing the uh, same query, uh, twice much maybe better idea depending on the case of yeah, course right absolutely that, that would be the direction i'd be leaning yeah okay but again i feel like there's more maybe more context around that question that if we understood you know could might change the answer because the situation might be different than we're imagining Okay, any recommendation regarding blog posts uh, on using query diagnostics other than Chris Webb? I would, Chris Webb is a good one there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't off the top of my head, and I'm not saying there aren't any. I feel like query diagnostics is an area that is still developing and still hopefully will continue to develop. You know, because it gives you a lot of raw data, but you still have to make sense out of it. I know Chris had a, uh, a couple functions, I believe, that, you know, he offered that helped do that. And, and I hope others will think about that, too. Or And, you know, who knows, maybe one day there'll be an option to build some kind of external tool that could consume that data and present it in some, you know, graphical way or, you know, because it's you get this. A lot of data you got to read through and sometimes that's really helpful and sometimes you know it'd be nice to have something that just summarized it and said here's the problem point you know here's where you're spending most of your works and you could just look at it and start going from there so yeah i'd say chris webb definitely worth searching to see if anyone else has something there but i don't know off the top of my head okay one more question is function ordering in um always sequ sequ uh, sequential for instance can't a function number one reference function number three does rendering folding moot? Oh, okay, so if by order we're talking about in that let expression, you know, the order you define functions, say that's the order you define functions is for just for your convenience. M execution, remember it's lazy, so it's going to start with the result clause that bit after the in statement and determine what data is needed. And then it's going to walk through your code to figure out how to produce that data. So when I was showing those examples of steps one, two, and three, really you could have written those in your M expression in any, any order in the source code. The order I was talking about would be the, you know, the order, you know, walking backwards from the result clause 
the order the references are made of, you know, where, you know, three would be the last reference or the, the clause referenced by the result clause, and two would be the one that three references and so on. So the literal syntax order is just for your convenience. It's the order of the data is used. So, so source code order, sequential or not, it's up to you. It's reference order is what matters. And so when we reorder them though, you know, in reference order, if, if I can swap, the third reference function and the second reference function so that three is two and two is three by, you know, slightly editing my code and get the same results, then, you know, that may help me position steps so that folding is more likely to take place or, or so forth. Okay, if we don't have further questions, uh, that but that was a tough session, <laughs> really. Yeah. <coughs> and thanks a lot for sharing your information with us. And sorry for my voice. <laughs> uh, I hope for our friends here listening, it is a deep session. You know, it's. I, if I could encourage you, even if all of it, you know, it may be something to tuck away for reference so that when you hit a problem in one of these areas or you hit one of these terms, you're like, wait, I heard about that somewhere before. Hmm. I did learn a couple rules about that. Maybe I need to go back and watch this then, or you know, maybe I don't understand it all coming away from this session, but at least I, I understand a little more about it. You know, it is deep, but when we get to these more complicated power queries and when we get to complex performance tuning situations, we do have to go deep. Thankfully, a lot of what we do in Power Query maybe doesn't need to go that deep, but you know, hopefully we've at least given you a couple tools so that when you hit one of those situations where the depth is necessary, you've got options on where to look and how to debug and how to move forward. So thank you very much for the invite to speak. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen. And hey, if you have an interest, hop over to bangerbato.com. There's the Power Query Imprimer series and other posts that may be of interest. Anything else or have a great evening. <laughs>